Another tournament scoff law bites the dust. Hi, I'm Philip Lumel. Welcome to No Uncertain Terms, the official podcast of the tournaments movement for the week of November 18, 2019. Your sanctuary from partisan politics. Evo Morales, former president of Bolivia, tried to make an end run around the voters in the Bolivian constitution by running for an illegal fourth term. It didn't work. Will it work for Mike Shirky and the lobbyists in Michigan? Let's ask Nick Tombalides, executive director of USTL. Hey, Nick. Well, Nick, the big tournament's news this week was from Bolivia. Um, President Evo Morales, he resigned last Sunday in uh, the face of violent protests in the streets after the socialist president tried to run for an illegal fourth term in office, even though the Bolivian constitution includes a two-term limit. It uh, started with the ignoring of a referendum from the people in which they affirmed the two-year limit, Mm -hmm. and then it went downhill from there. It looked like he was going to lose the election, probably on the base of that, uh, that, uh, ignoring the referendum. And when the returns started coming in, Morales halted the vote. 24 hours later, they decided that he won. (laughs) <laughs> right. And violence started in the streets. Well, I, I only listen to and believe what the mainstream media tell me. So okay. I think Ava Morales was an indigenous hero and uh, oh. he lifted, <laughs> lifted millions of people out of poverty. The guy was a dictator. He was a nasty, nasty dude. He would detain people without trial. He secret police, torturing people, killing political enemies. They've got corrupt courts over there. They've essentially got mob rule. I've got no sympathy for the guy, and the media really need to stop glamorizing him. With term limits, he's like a bad golfer, right? He keeps trying to take mulligans on this. He he (laughs) puts it into the Constitution himself in in 05, two five-year terms. Then he calls an election in 2009 and says, "Uh, you guys, that first term didn't really count. The limits start now. Trust me. And so, of right. course, the corrupt court agrees with him. He wins in oh, 2009, yeah. wins again 2014. Then he announces he's going for the fourth term. So he puts this thing on the ballot to abolish his own term limits, and the voters shoot yeah. it down. Yeah, absolutely. The voters wanted the term limits. They wanted it the first time. They want it the second time. Just because it applies to him didn't change their minds. So they rejected the attempt to overturn the term limits. So then he couldn't go in a straightforward fashion. Just like politicians all over the globe, he had to find a workaround. And so he um, went back to the constitutional court, Mm -hmm. which is all packed with his loyalists, naturally. And they're the same ones that allowed him to claim that his first term didn't count. It went back to them, and uh, he claimed, get this, that it was his human right to be president of Bolivia. A human right. And based on that argument, the constitutional court of Bolivia said, oh, well, yeah, his human rights are being violated. The irony is people under Morales in Bolivia have no human rights. They have no right, right to a fair trial. They have no freedom of speech. They, they have no food. I mean, people <laughs> are starving in the streets, and the courts are worried about this dictator having a right to run for re-election. It's absurd. Right. I mean, what happens when you're a dictator who's desperate, unpopular, and out of options? You rig the election. That's, That's exactly right. what he did. There was an outside auditor involved in this. They caught him stuffing the ballot, and then his fate was sealed. So he's now seeking asylum in Mexico, and we're awaiting a new election in Bolivia. You know, as you mentioned, he was seen as sort of a hero, at least on the left, um, when he was originally elected. And of course, he was elected. It's a quasi-democratic country. But as as you spend more time in power, especially with this large state apparatus, which he used against the people, you gain more and more power and, of course, more and more arrogance and become more and more corrupt. And then you change the rules so that you can stay forever. We saw the same thing happen in Venezuela and other countries in Latin America. And our audience can't see this, but when Phil says elect Morales was elected, he's making air quotes when he says elected. Yeah, because there was actually fraud in the election um, regarding the tournaments as well. It just wasn't sufficient. There was an awful lot of shenanigans going on in that vote. Um, but the people still want it. What does it say about the overwhelming uh, popularity and staying power of term limits that term limits can even win (laughs) when the subject of those term limits attempts to rig the election? That's how powerful this thing is. I have an article that I pinned a a while ago, and we can put it in the show notes. It's by uh, Zachary Kaufman. He's a fellow at the Kennedy School at Harvard, uh, formerly a Yale fellow. Great article, wrote a couple years ago, called Term Limits at Home and Abroad. 
And what he says is any time a foreign president tries to stay in office beyond term limits, the ruling class in D.C. is the first are the first people to condemn this person as like undemocratic and corrupt. Bolivia, Burkina Faso, uh, Djibouti, Uganda, wherever, wherever. But our politicians, American politicians, run in even more lopsided and rigged elections than these dictators. Our congressmen get reelected 98 percent of the time and they have no term limits. It's just hilarious. So, you know, I would just note that in Bolivia, there's a broad consensus that term limits are a check on power. It's essential. It's a safeguard. You see the backlash against this guy. The reactions across the board uh, to him trying to circumvent term limits, you call it eroding democracy. But then we tolerate endless tenure for our leaders here who are just as entrenched, whose elections are just as undemocratic and who have the same proclivity for corruption. That's right. And many of these politicians claim democracy is on their side when they oppose term limits. Oh, but we want to have the people have their vote. (laughs) What they really want is just to stay in office forever. On the November 12th podcast of Blunt Force Truth with Chuck Woolery, the great game show host and his sidekick Mark Young chatted with our own Scott Tillman about the state of the term limits movement. So the fundamental changes need to be made is that uh, there's so many years for you as a congressman, there's so many years for you as a senator, and then you go home and you live with the rules that you pass, you live with the laws that you pass, and like it or not, that's how your rest of your life is going to be. And of course, they don't live like that because they don't have to. No, and most of them never go back when they're done. Uh, This is one of the things we talk about, what is the best term limit for people? We support two Senate term and three House term term limit. And that's because the citizens at large want that. They think that once you're gone from home more than six years, you're very unlikely to come back to the profession you did before. You know, if you stepped away from teaching or, uh, you know, being a doctor or your personal business for more than six years, it's very hard to get back. It's hard enough to get back after six years. To hear the full interview with Scott and others with hosts Chuck Woolery and Mark Young, go to bluntforcetruth.com. Now, Michael Bloomberg, of course, is back in the race. He's running for president of the United States. He made some noise about it before. Well, now he's officially back. He's filed in a couple states, so he's in. And he's got a long history with tournaments that's not too much different than Ava Morales. <laughs> But the difference is when Bloomberg overturned term limits, nobody criticized – our federal government didn't criticize him. Well, that's right. You know, either either start practicing what you preach or cut the hypocrisy, I would say. Yeah. Well, you know, now that he's running for president again, I think we need to refresh our memories of exactly what Bloomberg did in New York because it's really a story of political arrogance, if you ask me. The voters of New York approved eight-year term limits in 1993, and they reaffirmed them in 1996 – so two votes on the subject. Both times voters said, tournaments, yes. Now, Mayor Bloomberg decided in 2009 that he wanted to run for a third term. So he did some internal polling to see if the voters might approve a change to go from 8 to 12 years to accommodate you know, his ambitions. He didn't like the results. So he went to the New York City Council and asked them to simply ignore the two previous referenda and weaken the tournaments with a simple council vote. And, you know, naturally... Uh, the sweetener for the council was, well, we'll weaken your tournaments too. So they, they went along with that, and so did yeah. the courts. So he won. Oh, so frustrating. And here's somebody that actually had called city council members in the past who had tried to weaken the tournaments disgraceful. But of course, when he's in office, it's different. Yeah, it's uh, term limits for thee, but not for me. We've seen That's this it. before. Uh, mm-hmm. it, we even actually saw it in New York City. Aftermath of 9-11, uh, there was a lot of speculation that Rudy Giuliani would stay beyond term limits because he was so essential to national security. Just oh, like right. we're told now that Bloomberg was so essential to uh, the financial security of this nation, despite the fact that the recession was pretty much over by the time oh, wow. he was seeking that third term. Um, <laughs> I was actually living in New York City at the time. I remember the resentment towards Bloomberg, and I remember the passion people had to restore the term limits. And what's often uh, lost in the shuffle is the voters will hold it against politicians who undermine term limits. They just did it to Morales. He couldn't get the majority that he needed to, to cling to power. Bloomberg was no exception. On the surface, you see he got a third term. It looked like he cruised barely. to it. But in reality, yeah, he barely scraped by. He had to spend $100 million bucks to mm-hmm. get that third term as mayor. He spent, I think, almost $200 a vote, outspent his opponent wildly. It was like 12 to 1. Nobody even knew his opponent. It was just some random guy. And Bloomberg only got reelected by, I think, 
fewer than five points. So oh, voters, are serious. they held it against him, but it just wasn't enough to overcome his well-oiled political machine. I was living in the city. They had posters with Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, you know, like the evil billionaire who owns the nuclear power plant. And the posters said, no third term, vote for Burns. <laughs> and, and believe it or not, in that election, Bloomberg was so unpopular, a lot of people wrote in for Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. He was the leading write-in write -in candidate during that mayoral election. <laughs> That's right. You know, it, what's the arrogance of this was uh, mind-blowing to me. His reason for needing that third term was because the nation was undergoing a uh, financial convulsion a recession. He's a financial guy, so only he apparently could handle the situation. But of course, he's the mayor of the financial capital of the entire earth, <laughs> pretty much. There are a lot of bright financial guys in New York City. And to think that he's the only person that could handle running municipal government at such a time is insane. Um, but that was his argument. you know. And like you said, the recession was sort of passing by late 2009 when the election was going to be held. And this was brought up to him at a press conference in May of that year where his arrogance was on full display. Let's, let's hear it. But uh, the bottom line is that there still is some business going on. And in fact, I'm reasonably optimistic that to return the corner, it's not um, going to be. If, if the economy is turning around, uh, as you said, does that mean that the rationale for extending ter term limits, which was the know, fiscal challenge? Get, why don't you just get serious questions here? No, and we'll no but the, the question is... The, the rationale when, for extending term limits is was the, the city council voted it and the public's going to have a chance on November 3rd to say what they want. And I don't think we have to keep coming back to that. When you have a serious question about the economy, I'd be happy to answer it. Uh, anything else? Thank you very much. Nothing else? Doesn't seem great. Thank you. Wow. Isn't that incredible? You know, but the punchline of this whole Bloomberg story is that after he got his third term, after he twisted the arms of the council, after he went through the courts to ignore these previous two referendum, a third referendum was held. In 2010, the voters had the choice again whether or not they wanted two or three term term limits. And guess what? They overwhelmingly, with 83 percent of the vote, said we want to go back to two term term limits that we had already approved twice. Incredible. You know, just like Evo Morales in Bolivia, just like Michael Bloomberg in New York City, we see the same arrogance on display again right now in Michigan. We talked about it in the last two podcasts where we see a situation where the voters spoke very clearly at the ballot box saying they wanted eight-year term limits. And we have the leaders of both the House and the Senate, the largest lobby in the state coming out trying to go around the voters with some kind of Mickey Mouse ethics package with tournaments hidden inside, trying to get around voters so that they can maintain their place in office. It's the same thing again going on in Michigan. If you live in Michigan and haven't done so yet, go to tournaments.com under our current actions tab. Go to the Michigan action and send a message to your legislators in Michigan telling them to keep their hands off the people's term limits. Hi, this is Scott Tillman, the National Field Director with U.S. Term Limits. U.S. Term Limits is celebrating a large number of pledgers being elected to the Louisiana State Legislature. We ask state legislators and candidates for state legislature to sign a pledge to help us term limit Congress. The pledge reads, I pledge that as a member of the state legislature, I will co-sponsor, vote for, and defend the resolution applying for an Article 5 convention for the sole purpose of enacting term limits on Congress. Most of us vote for our state House and state Senate members in even-year elections, but there are a few states with odd-year elections. Louisiana has odd-year elections. They voted Saturday, October 12th in a jungle primary. A jungle primary is an election where the candidates all appear together irrespective of party. If one candidate gets over 50% of the vote, they win, and if nobody gets over 50% of the vote, then the top two candidates proceed to a runoff election. The runoff election was held Saturday, November 16th. For the first time in Louisiana state legislative elections, U.S. term limits was aggressively telling voters which candidates pledged to support term limits for Congress and which candidates opposed term limits for Congress. It was a big win, and we will now have 34 members in the Louisiana legislature who will have pledged their support for term limits on Congress, 15% of the Louisiana State Senate and 26% of the Louisiana State House. Tune in to our next podcast, hear Phil and Nick discuss the importance of these wins to the term limits movement. 
Next year is going to be an even bigger year for state legislative elections. If you have access to a candidate, let them know how well the term limits candidates did in Louisiana and tell them to sign our pledge. Pledges are available at termlimits.com. This episode of On the Mark snuck by us when it ran nine months ago during the last governmental shutdown. Exasperated, anchor Mark Curtis of KPNX Channel 12 in Phoenix let loose on the dysfunctional U.S. Congress during an episode of his popular commentary segment. Well, on Fridays, my boss is here giving me the chance to get something off my chest. 28 days. That's how long it's been since the government was open for business. And even then, was it really? I'm not just talking about this petty tug of war between House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and our president. I'm referring to the people caught in the middle, almost a million federal workers, the collateral damage in all of this with mortgages and tuition and just lives to live. And I don't think that any of these politicians that we've sent to Washington give a damn about the people who are hurting because of their childish behavior which is why more than ever now, it is time for term limits. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the government. That's from the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, that's us. They lead us because we decided that they were smart enough and good enough to lead us. The problem is the longer they stay in power, the more they think they're untouchable, the less they think about the consequences of their actions and instead think about party ideology, writing their legacy and satisfying their egos by making sure that they win and the other side loses. And ask yourself this, when's the last time that Congress functioned effectively, right? You can't remember because these dinosaurs who are so addicted to the smell of money from lobbyists and are so set in their ways, the very thought of putting their egos in check to do something good for the country instead of the party is repugnant. A recent poll showed that more than 80% of Americans want term limits. You know who opposes that idea? Incumbent politicians and special interest groups. I say no more making a career out of sitting on your butt and collecting a paycheck and doing nothing. You go there, you serve your time, and please do it with integrity and honor because you won't be there for very long, and then get out and get a real job like the rest of us. The simple inability of ending this shutdown screams that now more than ever, it's time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of No Uncertain Terms. For our action item this week, we need to take some precautionary action against a potential flip-flopper in West Virginia. State Delegate Michael Angelucci of West Virginia signed the U.S. tournament's pledge to co-sponsor and vote for the resolution applying for an Article 5 convention for the sole purpose of enacting term limits on Congress. And he did so when HCR 61 passed the West Virginia House in 2019. Unfortunately, the bill did not get a vote in the Senate due to a last-minute filibuster by Senator Mike Romano. Well, arms are already being twisted in preparation for a new 2020 vote on the tournament's convention bill. Now, Delegate Angelucci says that he plans to give in and break his promise. Please go to tournaments.com forward slash flip flop and send a message to Delegate Angelucci if you live in West Virginia. Tell him to stand with the voters and not the lobbyists and career politicians who are pressuring him. You can also find this action item under the current actions tab at tournaments.com. Thank you. We'll be back next week. USTL. This podcast is made possible by the support of you, the American people, and your voluntary financial contributions, which can be made through our website at termlimits.com. Thank you.